السلام عليكم This video will be completely different than any other Islamic Golden Age video. I'm not gonna give you a couple of examples to show how Islamic history influenced the modern world. No. Instead, we will be playing a very nice game together. The game will be a story. I will tell you the absolute beginning of the story and the end of the story. And your job is to guess what happened in the middle. At the end of the video, if you write down the answer correctly, you can win a very valuable prize from Dean Academy. Get ready, bring your coffee, and let's start. See this small house? This is the house of a man called Al Arqam. Inside it, there was a small group of Muslims hiding from the pagan Arabs, fearing persecution, fearing death. They were very few in number, maybe 10, 20 people. They would meet in secret in this house every day to learn good manners, to discuss the situation of their society and other things. How about we zoom in together to try to hear a part of their conversation and find out what is really going on in there. Ready? Zoom. Guys, the situation in our society has become very tragic. People are divided into either wealthy masters who own everything or poor oppressed slaves. The rich merchants cheat in their business, do monopolies, give bribes to rulers to facilitate their oppression, and the rich temple priests are scamming people out of their hard-earned money. That is in exchange for good luck or God services that they have no control over and people are paying them for some reason. While on the other side, people are either slaves or will be slaves soon because of their overwhelming debt. There is no right or wrong anymore. There are no morals. There are only subjective opinions. And you know, of course, the opinion of the most powerful is always correct. Racism is eating the fabric of our society. The white man thinks he is automatically the master of every black man. Also, every tribe claims supremacy over other tribes. Each group thinks they are higher than any other. And because every tribe claims supremacy, we live in never-ending conflicts, violence, and war. People support their tribes whether they are correct or wrong. It doesn't matter. The only rule is, if he looks like me, I am automatically on his side. Full stop. A man would kill or die and he doesn't even know what he was fighting for. Intoxicants and drinks destroyed half of the brain cells of every wise man, until there were no wise men left. You see a man in the morning, handsome and respectable, but the same man in the evening, half-naked, vomiting in the middle of the street and licking his own vomit. Imagine. Gambling made some morons rich while destroying the lives of many. A man would lose his wealth in a cards game and then bet his wife in the next game and then lose his wife. This man who was a rich businessman in the morning ends his night as a drunk, homeless, lonely chill of a man with a broken heart. Bandits are everywhere and crime rates are through the roof. Educated people can be counted on the fingers of one hand, maybe two. Everyone is illiterate. No one has any knowledge nor can even read or write. Animals are greatly mistreated and tortured for benefit. People lost their hearts, people lost their mercy. People are mashing dates to make a dough and then use this dough to create their gods and worship them. Imagine? A man keeps worshipping his dough god until he gets hungry. Then he eats his god for dinner, and then he makes another god the next day. People definitely lost their minds, but their arrogance blinds them from seeing how ridiculous they have become. If a man was blessed with a newborn baby, he checks it. If it's a boy, he celebrates. If it's a girl, he buries her alive. And no one hears her when she cries out, For what sin have I been killed? 
And even if she was lucky enough not to be buried alive as a baby, most likely she will be forced into prostitution when she grows up. Women became objects. Women can't inherit, they can't own, they can't decide their future. Even delicious food are forbidden for women. They are only for men to eat. Men have no shame to the extent that they do wife swaps. Imagine wife swaps. That happens every time they get bored from their wives. And of course, adultery became very widespread. Day and night in every corner, in every street. Sometimes a group of men enter on one woman together. They can't see how disgusting is it. Many, many newborns don't even know their father and are destined to grow up without a family or even worse. People are extremely toxic. They use curse words in every conversation. They spread rumors, they gossip, they backbite, they slander, and they interrupt each other, mock each other, and take pride in extravagance and wasting resources. People are valued based on their pockets, not based on their morals. Usury became everywhere. Imagine, instead of helping the poor, they are taking advantage of their poverty. They ask the poor to pay double price. The rich are becoming richer, and the poor are becoming even more poor. Money became the real god of this world. A bribe goes a very long way. Even testimonials can be easily bought. Men even steal the inheritance of the orphans without feeling any shame. Leadership is not being given to whoever deserves it. Instead, it is mostly given to whoever has the cash. Some men started to act like women and some women started to act like men, losing their fitrah and changing the creation of Allah. People lost their way and with it, they lost everything. Our society is falling into mass depression, suicide and lack of meaning. What should we do? This nation is gone forever. We are just 10-20 people there is nothing we can do to fix all of that. We are too few and too weak to have any effect whatsoever. There is literally no hope. I think this is enough eavesdropping on those poor guys hiding in the house of Al-Arqam. Let's now skip forward, a lot forward, to the end of the story, to see exactly what happened in the end. And after that, I will ask you to guess what happened in the middle. I hope you can win the prize. One day, a caller was walking around the streets of one city. And he was saying in a loud voice, Oh my people, oh my people, anyone wants charity money? Oh my people, all of this money is to help anyone who is in need. Anyone wants financial help? But the surprise was no one answered. And the caller was confused, so he kept repeating. Oh my people, anyone wants money? I have all of this money for anyone in need. And no one answered. So he started to shout out with higher voice. I have all of this money from the Khalifa. It is meant to be delivered to anyone who is in need. Where are the people in need? And still, no one answered. He kept calling in other streets and other streets all around the city, but still no one answered. This is when the caller recognized that no one needs charity. No one is that poor. So he started shouting another question. He started saying, Oh my people, does anyone have debt? If you have debt, I can pay your debts. No one answered. So he started shouting. Oh my people, anyone wants to get married, I can buy you a house, pay your marriage cost, your wedding for example. Anyone? And no one answered. He kept trying different offers in different streets all over the city and still no one. The caller then wrote a letter and sent it back to the Khalifa Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, saying we are trying to distribute the charity money you sent us, but no one wants it. Maybe take your money back and find other cities. Maybe there are poor people in other cities, but not mine. 
The most surprising part is the following part. This was not the only letter the Khalifa received. Actually, the callers in all the cities sent back their money with letters saying exactly the same thing. And by the way, these are not like three or four cities. I am talking about more than half of the world back then. Because, you know, you exclude the Americas before the discovery of the Americas. So we're talking about from West China to Spain. That includes parts of India. And by the way, North and South too. From Middle Africa, somewhere around Nigeria to Southern Russia. So you're talking about more than half of the world back then. All of these cities, all of the streets in these cities, callers were calling to find one poor person they couldn't find any. The Khalifa then ordered them to help out non-Muslims. Find non-Muslim residents in our lands. Buy them what they need, pay their debts, whatever. This was round two. And the surprise was, they still didn't find any. Even non-Muslims, they didn't need charity. So in the end, after the Khalifa gave up, he ordered them to buy birds' food and throw it on top of every mountain so no one will ever be hungry. Not people, nor animals, nor birds. By the way, you might think that people were extremely rich as in millionaires and billionaires. No, they were not. Everyone had what they needed and maybe a little bit more. Yes, there were some rich people, but I'm talking about the majority. They had what they need. That's it. Being extremely rich was not the main goal of everyone's life. Pleasing God was the main goal. The difference between their society and ours is that the reasons for poverty did not exist in their society. For example, there was no oppression. There was no cheating in business. There was no monopolies, no usury, no extravagance. You know the culture of buying useless items just to show off that you're better than your neighbors? They didn't have that. There was no excessive buying to compensate for your deep insecurities and your depression. The rich were not becoming richer by squeezing the life out of the poor. The most beloved deed to everyone was helping out their brothers who are in need. So, it was very hard, very hard, near impossible to find someone in need because most likely someone helped him before you. And even those who were disabled or couldn't work for some reason, they were given this coin, each one of them. This coin has the Arabic words Allah Damin, which translates to Allah guarantees your provision. Anyone who had this coin would go periodically to the Islamic house of money and they get their provision for free. That also applies to orphans, to widows and so on. And because money does not buy happiness, I'm not going to focus on money. I want to tell you about the real happy society. Let's taste together the idea of the happy society that existed in reality. I will not read from a novel or a movie. This is real history. The difference between people faded away. There were no difference between black and white. There were no difference between Indian, Arab, African, European, Asian. Everyone was 100% equal in rights and duties. Everyone is your brother, whom you are ordered by Allah himself to take care of him more than you take care of yourself. Imagine living in that loving community. The borders between countries and tribes faded away. More than half of the world became one country ruled by one law, the law of God. So no passports, no borders, no entry visa, no one to accept or reject your visa. No. One big mass of land, all of them are brothers living under the rule of God. That's it. So no one has better nationality or better title. No. There were no subjective opinions, no never-ending debates, never-ending arguments, never-ending fights. All the major questions were already answered by God. 
Even family issues were very, very rare. As loving your wife and taking care of your family is also ordered by God. So there is no question about that. You feel safe at home. You feel safe in the street. And you feel safe when you are buying and selling. As you already know, no one is going to scam you. And even when rarely, rarely, something like that happens, the justice system was superior to any in history. Even competitive businesses cared for each other. I know this part specifically will sound like science fiction for some, especially those who know how business works today. Imagine competitive companies caring for each other. For example, merchants in the marketplace, they had a habit of having a small chair and put it in front of their shop. They put this chair in the early morning when they open their shop. And then every merchant who makes his first sale of the day, he removes the chair. Why? Because when you enter the marketplace, you will find merchants who have chair and merchants who don't. You will know which merchant already made his first sale and which didn't. So when a merchant receives his second customer, instead of selling to him, he tells the customer, how about you go find one of those merchants who didn't have their first sale of the day yet. It is better to make sure that everyone at least made their first sale before we start competing with each other. Again, this is not part of a fantasy story. These are real people who really cared for each other. The whole community was one big family. Slavery completely ended. As a slave got exactly the same rights as your biological son, so basically, even if someone got the title slave, in reality, he was treated exactly equal to your children. The only exception was inheritance. If you're unfamiliar with this transition, you can check out the Slavery in Islam video. But to cut it short, even the king of Egypt himself had the title slave. Women got their rights and more, more than they could imagine. After being treated like objects, the job of the man became to take care of his wife, providing for her, loving her, respecting her, and defending her with his life. A man is ordered to die for his wife, not the opposite. A man is ordered to provide for his wife, not the opposite. The rank of a man was set by the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, as follows. The best of you is the best to his wife. And the Prophet, by the way, also linked entering paradise to the five-star service that you provide for your old mother. This way, every woman was guaranteed superior care when she was young from her husband and when she was old from her children. Women also got the right to own property and to do business, to buy and sell, to work, to have their own savings. A woman's money is her money alone, but the man's money should be spent on him and his wife and his whole family together. Women also felt safer in their homes because they knew that there was no adultery in the society. Cheating was not allowed nor tolerated, and their husbands were not under constant 24-7 temptation by other girls. Women made their families their first priority, while also contributing to the society in many, many ways. If you are unfamiliar with this, you can check out the details in the Women in Islam playlist. Hygiene became the norm for literally everyone. The only way you can find a smelly, dirty, disgusting person who doesn't wash himself was to travel outside of the Muslim land, especially Europe back then. You all know the story. You would meet strangers in the street with 100% confidence that they at least wash themselves five times a day. That is, of course, in addition to after every bathroom. And you would also be confident that they are cleaning their teeth regularly. Everyone also took very good care of their health and their diet. No one ate excessively or ruined his body over the desire to fill his stomach. No one had any weird ideas. No one had opinions about what we should or shouldn't do or should or shouldn't eat. No one had any weird ideas about identifying as something he or she isn't. There was no hostility. 
no toxicity, no enmity between family members, neighbors, or even strangers. Animals were treated with mercy, no heavy loads, no pain was allowed either physically or emotionally. Education became a must. The literacy rate increased from near nothing to more than 90%. Learning religion was a must and learning dunya knowledge was highly, highly recommended. And that amazing emphasis on education led to this spectacular results. This is Al-Hasan ibn al-Haytham. He wrote more than 80 scientific letters and books. He was the first to write about vision, the first to write about mirrors, and the first to write about lenses. He also wrote the famous book Al-Manazir, where he corrected all the wrong theories about vision that we inherited from the Roman and the Greek cultures. For example, the Greeks believed that there were invisible rays emitted from our eyes, you know, like Superman? And they believed this is how people see things. But he was the first to discover that vision is caused by reflected light absorbed by our eyes, not the opposite. His work led to the invention of glasses, the invention of telescopes, and eventually the invention of the camera. Thanks to him, you are watching me right now. You can read more about him on the official website of the National Library of Medicine, Ibn al-Haytham, father of modern optics. You can also read this article, Ibn al-Haytham, the man behind the camera. This article will help you understand how his camera obscura principle is still used in the cameras today. This is Al-Khawarizmi, the famous mathematician and astronomer. He introduced the number system that we are using today. And he also introduced algebra. Yes, you heard me correctly. Algebra. Algebra is an Arabic word, by the way. It is pronounced correctly as Al-Jabr. Before Al-Khawarizmi, you would write, for example, 785 like this. But after him, you will write it like this. Before Al-Khawarizmi, you would write, for example, 14,000. 649 like this but after him we write it like this his very smart system to express numbers was dependent on using the number of angles of each symbol to represent the number itself for example number one has one angle number two has two angles number seven has seven angles number nine has nine angles and finally, the most important number that he introduced for the first time to the world, the number that all math wouldn't exist without it, number zero. He represented it by using this symbol that has zero angles. The amount of Americans who don't realize we use Arabic numbers is actually embarrassing. Okay, check out this survey. A polling agency asked Americans should schools in America teach Arabic numerals as part of their curriculum. And look at the responses. 56% of people said no. Can you imagine teaching math without Arabic numbers? You wanna go back to the Roman numerals or something? And look, it's one thing if you didn't know that these were the Arabic numerals. Like, it's a little bit embarrassing, but no big deal. You know, you learn something new every day. But for a majority of Americans to not only not know what Arabic numerals are, but to assume it's a bad thing automatically that they don't wanna teach their kids? Why, because it's Arabic? Things get even worse when you break it down by party. 40% of Democrats don't want it taught in schools, which is way bad enough already. But 72% of Republicans? It reminds me of that one time that 41% of Trump supporters said they'd support bombing Agrabah. You know, the fictional city in Aladdin. What a sad state for America, man. Like a majority of Americans are so bigoted that anything even remotely associated with Arabic is automatically bad. Ridiculous. That is in addition to the whole science of algebra. And of course, you already know that mathematics is the essential component of science. Without math, there would have been no science, no technology, and no modern era. Somebody actually came here in Oxford and said we need to educate the Iraqis. The Iraqis were teaching algebra when we were painting our faces blue and living in the forest. You think you need to educate the Iraqis? Really? What are you going to educate them in? This is a Zahrawi, also known as the father of surgery. One of his famous books is called At-Tasrif. 
It is a huge book, by the way. If you print it today, you print it into 30 parts. This book contains recipes to create anesthesia while explaining the active ingredients in every plant used. Think about that. The active chemical ingredient in every plant. It also introduces the designs of the surgical instruments necessary to perform successful surgery. The same surgical instruments are used today. This is Jaber ibn Hayyan. He invented chemical distillation. He discovered usages and creation methods for nitric acid, hyaluronic acid, sulfuric acid, sodium hydroxide, and others. He invented a chemical method to separate gold and silver. He invented the method for making liquid gold. And he invented fire-resistant paper. And he invented anti-rust paint for iron. These are just some examples of his hundreds of inventions in chemistry. Ah, by the way, chemistry is an Arabic word. The correct pronunciation for it is kimia. This is Abbas ibn Firnas, the famous inventor, engineer, aviator, physician, and Arabic poet. He invented the first ink pen in history while everyone else was using a feather. He innovated vision glasses. He created a sand clock. He created glass from sand. And of course, don't forget his amazing research in aviation and his first flight experiment in history. Even though the experiment failed, but it inspired humanity to try again and again after him, adding and refining his aviation theories until eventually that led to modern aeroplanes. This is Taqiy al-Din Muhammad ibn Ma'roof. He was the first to invent the mechanical watch. He also invented the crankshaft, which is essentially the backbone of the internal combustion engine. Also because of him, we got the steam engine. Read with me. A rudimentary impact steam turbine was described in 1551 by Taqiy al-Din, a philosopher, astronomer, and engineer in the 16th century Ottoman Egypt. It was Taqiy al-Din, not Thomas Newcomen. This is Ibn Sina. He wrote the Canon of Medicine, Qanun al tub This is the book that led the way to modern medicine. This book described 720 different medicines for different diseases. 720. He also invented the medical thermometer and also outside of medicine. He discovered that the speed of light is faster than the speed of sound. He described the sound waveform and how it is related to the disturbance that happens in the medium, i.e. air. He invented a device to determine the axis of the stars. And finally, he taught us the importance of psychotherapy and its effect on our health. This is Ismail Al-Jazari, the father of robotics. Yes, you heard me correctly, robotics. He created the concept of automatic machines. With a simple Google search, you can check out his amazing sophisticated automatic machines that were powered by water flow. These machines were the first machines to be programmed to perform specific tasks on specific timers without any human intervention robotics. He also was successful to convert rotary motion to linear motion. And if you are an engineer, you would really appreciate how that affects all mechanical components today. This is Abu Bakr al-Razi, also known as the magician of medicine. He was the first to use alcohol as an antiseptic and opium as anesthesia. He was the first physician to find stones in the bladder, and he was the one who used Satan in surgery. He was the first to invent surgical seizures from animal intestines, and he was the first to discover allergic asthma, and he formulated the first known description of smallpox and measles, defining the symptoms, causes of the two diseases. He invented the first medical ointment, Every time you use an ointment, remember him. His contribution greatly influenced the development of modern medicine. This is Abdul Rahman ibn Khaldun. 
you might know him as the famous Muslim scholar. But did you also know that he is the founder of all the modern disciplines of historiography, sociology, economics, demography, and political science? That is, of course, besides being an Islamic scholar and a judge. The introduction to his book alone, only the introduction, was so big that it got printed into three separate books. Yes, these three books that you can see right now, this is the introduction to Ibn Khaldun's book. If you are interested to learn the reasons behind the prosperity or the failure of any state in history, you just need to read the introduction to his book. This is Muhammad al-Idrisi, also known as the man who made up the world's first map ever. If you compare his work in geography to any other work prior to his research, you will see with your own eyes the huge difference and the huge advancement that he achieved. This is Ibn Battuta, the great explorer. If you are interested in such fields, you can read this book, The Travels of Ibn Battuta. He traveled four times the distance as Marco Polo. But you know, they only teach you Marco Polo in school because Ibn Battuta was a Muslim from Morocco. If you want to learn, if you want to really learn how normal societies lived happily in harmony together in different places around the world, that is of course before individualism ruined all of our lives, read the books that he wrote at the end of his journey. He will describe wonders to you. This is... Ammar al mawsili the famous ophthalmologist and surgeon. He invented the hypodermic syringe. Try to imagine our lives without that invention. He also invented the first surgical method for cataract surgery. He designed and invented the holodrill for suctioning the soft cataracts. And he also invented a method to treat strabismus in children. This is Ibn Rushd al-Andalusi. You might know him as a Muslim scholar in fiqh, but did you also know that he was a great philosopher, physician, astronomer, judge, language expert, and the author of many, many books? He wrote 28 books on philosophy, 20 books on medicine, 8 on law, 5 on theology, 4 on language, and others. This is Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. You might know him as the great Muslim scholar in fiqh, aqidah, tafsir, and hadith. But did you also know that he was a great doctor, a teacher of medicine, and a scholar in mathematics, a judge, and a poet? This is Abdul Rahman al-Jabarti. You might know him as a Muslim scholar in Hanafi fiqh. But did you also know that just because of him, all the industrial sciences in our nation were improved to another level. He also was a great historian, by the way. His history books are one of the most trusted today. This is Ibn Taymiyyah. You might know him as the Muslim scholar in fiqh, sharia, hadith, and tafsir. But did you know that he was also an expert in comparative religion, in chemistry, in physics, psychology, sociology, and philosophy? He spoke four languages fluently, and he was famous for debating every scholar in his field. The Islamic world was the source of innovation, knowledge, and science for the whole world for more than a thousand years. Baghdad, it was the intellectual capital of the world. That's why our numerals are called Arabic numerals, because they pioneered the use of these numerals and invented algebra, itself an Arabic word, an algorithm. Two thirds of the stars in the night sky have Arabic names. How does that happen? Because they had navigating devices, astrolabes. The windmill was another invention attributed to the Islamic world. So the windmill was invented in 634 for a Persian caliph, and initially electricity wasn't made from these windmills. Instead, they were used to grind corn as well as drop water for irrigation. You can't really count the inventions made by the Muslim world. The invention of soap, shampoo, toothbrushes, vaccinations, rockets, torpedoes, paychecks, history authentication science, architecture, and many, many others. 
So most of us were taught in school that inculcation or vaccination was invented by Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur. It was actually Muslims who first came up with this technique, which was later brought to Europe from Turkey by the wife of the English ambassador in the year 1724. Children in Turkey were vaccinated with cowpox to fight the deadly smallpox at least 50 years before the West had discovered it. Halfway in, we got rocket and torpedoes. Although the Chinese invented saltpeter and gunpowder and used it in their fireworks, it was actually the Arabs who worked out that it could be purified using potassium nitrate and be used for military purposes. By the 15th century, they had invented both a rocket, which they called a self moving and combusting egg, and also they invented a torpedo, which was a self propelled pear shaped bomb with a spear at the front of it, which allowed it to impale enemy ships and and then phew, explode. Even hygiene, diet and health guidelines that we are being taught today, all of them exist in very old medicine books from the Islamic world. Books that were written when Europe didn't even understand the meaning of taking a shower. When a pair of Ivy League mathematicians in 2007 examined the intricate tile work of the medieval Islamic world, they were astounded by what they saw. Here was evidence of sophisticated geometric patterns that were understood in the West only 500 years later. Nonetheless, the researchers could not bring themselves to credit Muslim mathematicians with such a discovery. I wrote the House of Wisdom to address the collective amnesia that has left many of us with the unshakable, if deeply misguided conviction that the world of Islam and that of the West have nothing in common. The book introduces the reader to some of the crowning achievements of Islamic science across fields of astronomy, mathematics, medicine, chemistry, and philosophy, all of which were ultimately co-opted as uniquely Western knowledge. I want to show you two pictures side by side. This is the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, and this is Apple headquarters today. The difference between the two pictures is 1,000 years. I want you to give yourself a minute to think about it. Baghdad became a city of one million people, countless libraries packed full of manuscripts and books that were just aching to be studied by scholars from around the world who flocked to the Muslim capital. One of the most desired attractions to see once these foreigners arrived would be the Bayit al-Hikmah, or the House of Wisdom. It was the largest library in the entire city and served as a remarkable influence for the contemporary advances in artistry, literature, astronomy, medicine, and more. This is Fatima al fihriya She built the first ever university in history. And it is still standing and functioning today, by the way. It is called the University of al qarawiyin You can read about that fact on the Guinness World Record website. And as usual, because it was in a Muslim city in Morocco, made by a Muslim woman, the Western world sometimes pretend it doesn't exist. You might find sometimes on random websites on the internet that the first ever university in history was in Bologna, Italy. Even though this university in Bologna, Italy was established 229 years after al qarawiyin Typical Western behavior. But if you want straight up facts, check the Genesis World Record website. By the way, the second established university in whole human history also was in the Muslim world. It is called Al-Azhar University, and it is still working until today, by the way. A little bit pricey, though. Check out the dates of establishment. How impressive is that? Do you know the graduation attire every student put on today all over the world? This attire in the picture. This is an imitation of the historical graduation of Muslim students from Muslim universities. The gown is still the same, but the only difference is the hat. See this square on top of the hat? The Muslim students used to put the Quran over their head to symbolize, of course, the primacy of the scripture over the intellect. But non-Muslims can't do that. So instead of putting the Quran over their head, they put this weird square. Other than that, the ceremony is exactly the same. By the way, that also applies to libraries. According to CNN, for example, the world's 
all this library is the library of al qarawiyin established in the 9th century. Remember when we were talking about Al-Hasan ibn Al-Haytham, the father of optics, and we mentioned all of his amazing discoveries in the field of vision and optics? Mm, do you know that these inventions and discoveries, yeah, of course, they are amazing, but they are not the most important of his work? He did something that is much, much, much more important contribution to humanity. If you scroll down the same article we were reading before on the National Library of Medicine, you will find this paragraph. According to the majority of historians, Al-Haytham was the pioneer of the modern scientific method. Wait, what? The scientific method was made by a Muslim scientist? Then why do all of these idiots keep saying, do you believe in God or do you believe in science? The scientific method itself was introduced to the world by Muslims. Here is another article on the UNESCO website about Ibn al-Haytham's scientific method. You can read it after the video. And if you think he got lucky inventing the scientific method, you are wrong. As the idea itself was inspired by the Quran itself. Yes? The Quran is the only religious text in the whole world that challenges its reader, prove me wrong. The Quran also says, if you are in doubt, do this. If you are in doubt, do that. We talked about all of that in details, by the way, in this video, The Prophet's Magic Pen. I will leave a link to it in the description. But for now, I want to summarize. The Quran has a falsification test. I want you to think as a Muslim scientist for a minute. If the words of God have a falsification test, why shouldn't scientific theories have it too? And if you are familiar with the scientific method, you understand where I am going. The Quran says, prove me wrong. That's one of the claims of the Quran. And the Quran says, if you're in doubt, then do this. It has a falsification test. Okay, yes. And the scientific method itself came from a man named Hassan ibn Haytham, approximately 800 years before Galileo. Okay. He's referred to as the first scientist. Okay. Even secular historians yeah. like yeah. David yeah. C. Lindberg, he agrees the scientific method came from the Islamic world. Sure. So falsification is something we believe in. Finally, before I end this point, some of you will write down in the comment claims that Roger Beacon invented the scientific method. Let me stop you before you write it down. This is Robert Brefold, the famous social anthropology expert and historian. Let me read you a paragraph from his book, The Making of Humanity, specifically page 200. It was under their successors at the Oxford School that Roger Beacon learned Arabic and Arabic science. Neither Roger Beacon nor his later namesake has any title to be credited with having introduced the experimental method. Roger Beacon was no more than one of the apostles of Muslim science and method to Christian Europe. And he never wearied of declaring that a knowledge of Arabic and Arabic science was for his contemporaries the only way to true knowledge. He was the apostle of Muslim science and method, not the inventor. This is George Sarton, the famous chemist and historian. Let me read you a paragraph from his book, The History of Science and the New Humanism. It was about the experimental spirit. This was primarily due to Muslims down to the end of the 12th century. You know that Islam entered Constantinople in 1453 CE, right? But do you know that this year is exactly the same year that marks the end of the Dark Ages? Think about it. According to the Telegraph, for 700 years, the international language of science was Arabic, and Baghdad, the capital of the mighty Abbasid Empire, was the center of the intellectual world. Back then, if someone anywhere around the world wanted to look smart in front of his friends and colleagues, he would brag about the fact that he can speak a couple of words in Arabic. And that is how you can find Arabic words in every language now. You can find Arabic words in English, Spanish, French, German, whatever. I will give you some examples. Algorithm, Arabic word. Algebra, Arabic word. Chemistry, Arabic word. Sugar, coffee, attar. Average, caravan, check, gazelle, giraffe, jasmine, 
lufa, mummy, saffron, spinach, syrup, tangerine, tuna, cable, cover, harbor, and many, many more. All of them Arabic words. You know, the same way now you find people in India or in Africa throwing a couple of English sentences in their day-to-day conversation? In the past, people all over the world used Arabic words in their conversations until these thousands of words became part of their own languages. Even the king of England in 780 printed gold coins featuring his name on one side and featuring the Islamic declaration of faith on the other side. Written in Arabic, by the way. This is one of those coins from the front, and this is one of those coins from the back. And here is a better view, by the way. I am sure you understand what this symbolizes. Any abbreviated list of the achievements of Islamic science would surely include the introduction of algebra, breakthroughs in trigonometry, navigation, and cartography, a sophisticated theory of vision, the fundamentals of medicine, advanced astronomical models, and complex architectural design and construction techniques, setting off an intellectual arms race as lone scholars, princes, and potentates all competed for translation of Arabic texts that would help lay the foundation for the Renaissance. Sadly, this honeymoon was short-lived. Later generations of European scholars sought to bury all traces of Islamic influence. And so successful were these efforts that to this day, high school and college textbooks rarely acknowledge our intellectual debt to the Muslim world. This is the Library of Congress. They had a very good idea for the decoration of the ceiling of the library. They painted a list of every civilization that existed and their most important contribution to humanity. For example, Italy contributed fine arts. France emancipation. But check this out. Islam, physics. Yes, yes, think about it again. Islam, physics. Please let those Islamophobes who keep saying, do you believe in science or do you believe in God? Let them look at this picture for a minute. This is Martin Luther, the one who initiated the Protestant Reformation. Of course, you know him. Let me read for you what he wrote about the religion of the Turks. I don't know why he called it that, but okay, whatever terminology he wants to use. The modesty and simplicity of their food, clothing, dwelling, and everything else, as well as the fast prayers and common gathering of the people, that this book reveals are nowhere seen among us, or rather it is impossible for our people to be persuaded to them. Our religious are mere shadows when compared to them and our people clearly profane when compared to theirs. Not even true Christians, not Christ himself, nor the apostles or prophets ever exhibited so great a display. This is the reason why many persons so easily depart from faith in Christ for Muhammadism. Wow, Muhammadism. So he is the one who invented this weird word. Depart from faith in Christ for Muhammadism and adhere to it so Tensiously. I sincerely believe that no papist, monk, clerk, or their equal in faith would be able to remain in their faith if they should spend three days among the Turks. Here I mean those who seriously desire the faith of the Pope and who are the best among them. You can, by the way, read the whole thing yourself in this book, page 129. Anyway, this is King Charles III. I want to read for you a small part of his speech. If there is much misunderstanding in the West about the nature of Islam, there is also much ignorance about the debt our own culture and civilization owe to the Islamic world. It is a failure which stems, I think, from the straitjacket of history, which we have inherited. The medieval Islamic world from Central Asia to the shores of the Atlantic was a world where scholars and men of learning flourished. But because we have tended to see Islam as the enemy of the West, as an alien culture, society, and system of belief, we have tended to ignore or erase its great relevance to our own history. 
Islam can teach us today a way of understanding and living the world which Christianity itself is the poorer for having lost. At the heart of Islam is its preservation of the integral view of the universe. Islam refuses to separate man and nature, religion and science, mind and matter, and has preserved a metaphysical and unified view of ourselves and the world around us. You can watch the whole speech, by the way, on the Royal Family official YouTube channel. The Muslim world was the only shining light on earth for a thousand years. They lived the perfect life. Happy societies, strong family ties, safe environment, amazing justice, great education, and great innovation. They had great hygiene and diet. They were role models for every society that was aspiring to become better. They had good relationships with every other religion and every other country with, of course, one exception. The one exception who hated the Muslims no matter what. The European crusaders who always thought they were better and they own everything. The crusaders who never stopped trying to invade new lands, steal, kill and destroy. And by the way, the end of this amazing 1000 years of prosperity was by their hands after they finally finally managed to invade most of the world and steal all of their wealth and steal their knowledge then they claimed that they invented the modern world from scratch and then deleted the history of everyone else they will of course hide all of these facts from your school history books they will teach you that the first university was not in Morocco, it was in Italy. They will teach you that vaccination was invented by Edward Jenner instead of saying that he took it from the Muslims in Turkey. They will never teach you that all of these technologies were taken or stolen from Muslim libraries. Even when it is so obvious, they can't really hide the fact that something was invented by a Muslim scientist. In your school book, they will change the name of the scientist. For example, Al-Hasan ibn al-Haytham in your school science book is called Al-Hasan. What does this word mean and where did they get it from? Another example, Ibn Sina is called Avicina. Al-Zahrawi is called Abu Qasis. What is that? They call Ibn Rushd al-Andalusi Averos. They call Jabir ibn Hayyan Jibir. Do you know why they invented these funny made-up names? They want you to assume that these are Latin names, therefore they were European scientists. Those made-up names are just part of the big heist. I hate the double standard of how we name things when they're discovered by Europeans as opposed to non-Europeans, especially in math and science. Like, normally we name things after the person who discovered them to honor their work and their legacy, you know, like Gauss's law, Euler's identity, Bernoulli's principle. But when a Muslim does it, al karajis theorem? No, actually, we're gonna call that one the binomial theorem. Or al kashis law? No, actually, that's the law of cosines. The most frustrating one to me has to be the quadratic formula, because it's so important in mathematics, and it's so ubiquitous, like every high schooler has heard about the quadratic formula. And it involves two of the most brilliant minds in all of the history of mathematics, Brahmagupta and El Khwarizmi. And we called it the quadratic formula? Why? The worst, though, is the stolen credit. Like Snell's law? Not discovered by Snell. Discovered by Ibn Sahil 600 years earlier. Fibonacci sequence? Not Fibonacci. Known in India for hundreds of years. They buried all the traces of the 1,000 years of prosperity of the Muslim world. The Muslim world that covered more than half of the world back then. 1,000 years. Do you know how long is 1,000 years? Think about the fact that the whole history of the United States is just 240 years. Now imagine 1,000 years of supreme prosperity in every field. You really need to check out this video, the story of Salah and the thief. It will show you how is it possible for thieves to become the masters and then look down at their victims. I will leave a link to it in the description below. Finally, I want to end with these three quotes. The first quote is from the book, The Making of Humanity, specifically page 202. It is regarding the development of science. 
and those arose directly and solely as a result of Arabian civilization. Down to the 15th century, whatever scientific activity existed in Europe was engaged in assimilating Arab learning without greatly adding to it. The second quote is from the writings of Hartwig Hirschfeld. We must not be surprised to find the Quran regarded as the fountainhead of all sciences. The Quran is the fountainhead of all sciences. If you want to read the whole thing, this is the name of the book I was reading from page 9. And finally, I want to quote Francis Bacon himself. It is true that a little philosophy incline man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bring man's mind about to religion. Of course, you know for whom I brought this quote. Now I have summarized for you the beginning of the story and the end of the story. The beginning was when a small group of men were hiding in the house of Al-Arqam, fearing persecution, fearing death, thinking about the complete degeneracy and corruption of their ignorant, backward, desert-dwelling Bedouin society. And the end of the story was when the same group ruled more than half of the world to prosperity, safety, peace, happiness, harmony, justice, and scientific development. It is your turn now. Guess what happened in the middle. Guess what happened that changed the situation from the absolute bottom to the absolute top. What was this new thing that was introduced that succeeded in fixing all the issues of everyone from China to Spain, from Middle Africa to Russia? Was it magic? Or was it brilliance? Or was it something far more superior? How did more than half of the world suddenly become brothers? How did everyone become part of that prosperity, except of course for the crusaders? And whatever your answer is, do you think if this answer worked one time, can we apply it again today? Do you think if we use the exact same solution right now, can it fix all the world problems today? Can it fix all the world problems we are facing now? Don't just listen to me and nod your head. Write down now in the comments your answer. And as promised, if you write the correct answer, you have a very good chance to win two one-on-one -on -one private online lessons at Dina Academy. You can choose to have these two lessons in Quran recitation or in Arabic language. And before you ask, yes, female students have female instructors and all of the instructors are native speakers. Anyway, the next video will be the middle part of the story. The part that you are trying to guess now, but it will be described in details. Subscribe so you won't miss it. And don't forget that there are millions around the world who are in desperate need for the guidance of Allah to reach them. So like to boost this video's reach on YouTube and then share it on your social accounts. You can also, by the way, download it and upload it to your channel. It is 100% copyright free. Finally, if you want to learn more than 200 pieces of evidence that will definitely prove to you that Islam is the truth, check out this playlist, Miracles of Islam. I am sure it will change your life forever. Link is in the description. Also, don't forget to check the video we talked about, Salah and the thief. It will also change your perspective a lot. Thanks and don't go before you listen to some Quran with me. Salam alaikum. <laughs> أن قد وجدنا ما وعدنا ربنا حقا فهل وجدتم ما وعد ربكم حقا قالوا نعم فأذن مؤذن بينهم اللعنة الله على الظالمين الذين يصدون عن سبيل الله ويبغونها عوجا 
ويبغونها عوجا وهم بالآخرة كافرون وبينهما حجاب وعلى الأعراف رجال يعرفون كلا بسيماهم ونادوا أصحاب الجنة أن سلام عليكم لم يدخلوها وهم يطمعون وإذا صرفت أبصارهم تلقاء أصحاب النار قالوا قالوا ربنا لا تجعلنا مع القوم الظالمين وإذا صرفت أبصارهم تلقاء أصحاب النار قالوا ربنا لا تجعلنا مع القوم الظالمين ونادى أصحاب الأعراف رجالا يعرفونهم بسيماهم قالوا ما أغنى عنكم جمعكم وما كنتم تستكبرون أهؤلاء الذين أقسمتم لا ينالهم الله برحمة ادخلوا الجنة لا خوف عليكم ولا أنتم تحزنون ونادى أصحاب النار أصحاب الجنة أن أفيضوا علينا من الماء أن أفيضوا علينا من الماء أو مما رزقكم الله قالوا إن الله حرمهما على الكافرين الذين اتخذوا دينهم لهوا ولعبا وغرتهم الحياة الدنيا الذين اتخذوا دينهم لهوا ولعبا وغرتهم الحياة الدنيا فاليوم ننساهم فاليوم ننساهم كما نسوا فاليوم ننساهم كما نسوا لقاء يومهم هذا وما كانوا بآياتنا يجحدون ولقد جئناهم بكتاب فصلناه على علم هدى ورحمة هدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون